This is the day that the Lord has made. Welcome to worship this morning. It is great to have you here with us. Um, if you are visiting, especially, um, it's, uh, we're just grateful that you've taken time to spend time with us this morning. And of course, uh, in the worship of our God together. I ask that you would take the uh, fellowship pads that are on the inside of the pews and sign your name and pass the pass that down, and then pass it back so you can see with whom you're worshiping this morning, and have a couple announcements that want, uh, would like to draw your attention to. Um, one is a reminder that on the 7th, we are going to be having a prayer retreat on September 7th here at the church that Lee and I are going to be leading, and a number of people have uh, asked, so what are we going to do? Right? Um, and um, we're not going to sit in prayer for, you know, seven solid hours. Um, but what we're going to do is explore different ways of praying to help enrich your prayer life. Um, you know, sometimes we, our, our prayer just feels kind of stale. And finding other ways of praying that the church has used over the years can be helpful in encouraging us to um, just kind of freshen up our prayer lives. So we will be looking at a number of different ways of praying and taking opportunities to do that. We're going to do things like um, using the Lord's Prayer as a pattern for prayer, uh, talk about the, the daily office, which is a, another way of praying. We're going to do a prayer walk uh, around the church. We'll talk about uh, contemplative prayer and a, and a way of praying at the close of day called examine, which um, if you want to find out what that means, you can show up for the retreat, right? So, um, and the sign-up sheet will be out on the, uh, the Welcome Center table, so feel free to sign up for that. Also, that same weekend, we are going to be worshiping in the park. That is, we'll be down on the green space, uh, uh, down between the, the Harbor Masters and the pier, and would love to have you there with us uh, for that service. It was a, uh, just a really nice uh, opportunity last year and count on it being that again this year. Okay. And we also have a minute for mission this morning from Gretchen Grad, who's going to share with us about a ministry with which she is uh, very involved and which she in fact started. So yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Brian and I live in Chicago for most of the year, but we're uh, lucky enough to spend parts of the summer in Birchwood, and so it's my privilege to worship with you frequently in the summertime. Um, if you were here for last week's sermon, uh, Pastor Kip talked about risk and uh, the joys that can come from answering a call, even if it's not what you expected. Um, I think that also applies to the youth who come to Hands of Peace. Uh, Hands of Peace is a nonprofit based in Chicago, and every summer we bring uh, close to 100 Israeli, Palestinian, and American high school youth together. Um, and they are risking everything by going against the tides of their societies and reaching out to one another through very intensive dialogue, which is full of risk and full of tears, but that's where the discovery and the understanding and the tools come uh, to enable them to be leaders of change in their own communities. So I just wanted you to be aware that there is this mission going on that is called Hands of Peace. Uh, it's been around for 16 years. We've had over 650 young people go through the program who are now not so young anymore. They're in their 20s, their 30s, and they are doing remarkable things. They are working in, um, in embassies, and they're working in the diplomatic field, and they're working for nonprofits. Um, so we just wanted you to be aware that uh, this is going on in the world. Um, I have two friends with me from Chicago today who are also deeply involved with Hands of Peace, Debbie and Lisa. We'll all be in the gathering place um, after service and would love to share with you the mission. Um, there's also an opportunity for American adults who would like to travel to Israel-Palestine. Maybe that's been on your bucket list and you've thought this is a part of the world I'd like to explore. Here's a very meaningful way to go and explore that area with an Israeli guide and a Palestinian guide. It's not your usual church trip or synagogue trip, it's really a blend. Um, happy to share information about that with you. Um, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Grant. I don't know if you mentioned that you had stuff set up in the gathering place, but it is in there and um, yeah. So, um, and now let us continue our worship as we listen to our prelude this morning. Good morning. We gather in worship with this invitation from our Lord. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths will proclaim your praise. Please rise in body or spirit, and let us sing our opening hymn, number 466, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Mighty God, we do not yet see the glory you plan for all humankind, but in faith we do see Jesus. We thank you for the humility and holiness in which he lived and died. We praise you that he freed us from our sin, that he comforts and strengthens us through our struggles, and that he gives us courage to follow him. For this we now join with all creation and shout for joy, Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, each week we come before the font. We come confessing our sin, acknowledging where we've fallen short. And we do this because it's the hard work we need to do to grow into the people that God calls us to be. And so once again this morning, we take time to reflect on where we are, where we've fallen short, and to reflect on the great mercy of our God who welcomes us every time back to him. So let us confess in that confidence first silently and then together using the printed prayer. In praying together, merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us at our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hear that. There is no condemnation for you if you belong to Christ. And therefore, I declare to you in his name, you are forgiven. So be at peace. As God has forgiven us in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. Please greet your neighbors.
is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him that sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All creation I sing, praise to the King of kings, you're my everything, and I will adore you. and rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rows of thunder blessing honor strength and glory and power be to you the one only wise king Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You're my everything and I will adore you. Holy, 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 holy Filled with wonder, awesome wonder At the mention of your name Your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a mystery. Mm -hmm. You are holy. Ooh, you're holy. God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. spoke to the, the children we have in worship this morning who would rather not come up and stand in front of everybody, which I fully get, um, particularly when you're visiting a new place. But I wanted to share a little of what we were going to reflect on together because we're reading a passage from Isaiah today. And in this passage in Isaiah, there's, um, as you listen to it, you notice God gets really angry with his people. I mean, really angry with his people. 
And I'm pretty sure most of us, whether we're, we're young now or we're young once, remember our parents getting really, really angry with us. Did anybody not experience that? Okay. And the thing about that okay, is that our parents got really angry with us when we messed up because they love us, not because they don't. And God's the same way. God gets really angry with us when, when we do things that are wrong, when we're unkind to others, when we mess up, because he loves us. Okay? And that idea that God's anger is an expression of God's love is something that you know, I think is worth paying attention to as we listen to, to the things that uh, Scripture tells us. Yeah. And let's say a quick prayer uh, regarding that. God, we thank you that, um, that you love us so much that you get angry with us, that we actually matter enough for you to care. And so we ask that um, just as uh, we remember when our parents are angry with us, that, you love us, that they love us, that we might remember when your anger is expressed, that it's expressed out of love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer for illumination. <clears throat> our Lord and our God, now as we hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. You may find this on page 556 in your pew Bible. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The word of God for the people of God. Speak to God. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 49 through 56. You may find this on page 846 of your pew Bible. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on there will be five in one family, divided against each other. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father. Mother against daughter, daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, 
When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. How is it you don't know how to interpret this present time? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews as we continue to look at uh, chapter 11, which is uh, broadly known as the faith chapter. This morning we are going to be uh, starting in chapter 11, verse 29, and we'll be continuing through chapter 12, verse 2. You can find this on your, uh, in your pew Bible on page 975, or if you have your own Bible or a Bible app in which to follow along. But let us attend to God's word for us this Sunday morning. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. you please pray with me? Lord our God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight. For you are God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week we looked at the, the first half of this faith chapter, chapter 11 in Hebrews. Yeah. And we talked about the idea that the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is fear. And when we recognize that, that faith is, is not about whether we understand everything or whether we have doubts, but whether we trust our God, then we're able to risk doing things in faith, doing things for God's kingdom, doing things in service of others. We didn't talk so much, though, about the results of those, those actions of faith, how things pan out when we, when we actually respond in faith instead of fear. 
And we start out here listening to some pretty inspirational stories about the results of being faithful. Yeah. We all like those, those inspiring stories, don't we? Yeah. There's, there's mag magazines like guideposts that have these uplifting stories in them. We all like reading those and seeing movies and, and talking to people, hearing stories about when faith has, has shown up in people's lives and done wonderful things. We love those inspiring stories about someone who was sick and the doctors had, had tried everything and given up. But then people prayed. And they went back into the doctor and, and everything was fine. And the doctors just shrugged saying, we don't know what happened, but you're fine now. Okay. And we, we are lifted up by seeing a miracle like that happen. Okay. We love those stories about someone who was an addict or an alcoholic who finally, in the midst of the darkest point, turned to Christ and were surrounded by friends and family who loved them through that. And now, now they're doing great. Yeah. Now they're, they're living well, they've got a good job, and they're serving, you know, serving in the church. And we love those stories. Right? We like to be inspired because it, it encourages us to go out and, and risk to act in faith. And knowing that, the writer of Hebrews gives us all these examples where, where people have acted in faith and it's really turned out well, right? About these people who, you know, crossed the, the sea on dry land to escape out of slavery. About people who, you know, who marched around Jericho in faith and the walls came down. He goes on and talks about people who, who in their faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, closed the mouths of lions, escaped the edge of the sword. Okay. All this inspiration. And we need that. But there's a flip side to it too. If all we ever see, all we ever hear, all we ever read are these success stories of faith. Okay. Well, it's kind of like social media. Okay. I was reading, uh, once again, another study that was looking at the effects of social media on youth. Okay. And while they were studying youth, honestly, I think it applies to, to us who aren't so much youth anymore. Okay. We see on on. Facebook, these pictures of people with their smiling families, having fun at the beach, going on vacation, eating fantastic meals. Okay. Some people even post pictures of their puppies. And, and, and um, for those of you who aren't, aren't aware, we've got a new puppy. Okay. I sometimes post pictures of him, and, and it, you know, he sure is cute. Okay. You know, the thing is, though, when you look at those pictures on Facebook and see this wonderful, darling little little canine. What you don't see are the, the holes in my arms and the bruises on our legs. Right? You see, in Facebook, we just, we just get the highlight reels. Social media does that. We, we post the best of the best. And when you're getting a steady diet of that, you're looking at everybody else's perfect lives with their perfect families and their perfect pets, with those perfect meals they eat. Right? And we realize that's not me. That's not how my life is. And people get discouraged. They get depressed. Because we know that that's not the way life is. Sometimes things don't go well. And we need to hear those stories too. And so the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, look, these people did great things as people of faith, but, but there were others. There were others who were tortured. There were others who faced jeers and flogging and chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, sawed in two, killed by the sword. They were destitute. All they could wear were sheepskins and goatskins. They were mistreated and persecuted. They were homeless. No place to live but, but caves and, and holes in the ground. 
by worldly standards, that doesn't sound like faith doing its thing, does it? There are churches who, who emphasize only the inspirational part right? and tell you that if you, if you have faith, it's going to be good. You're going to have, you're going to have a, a great life. You're going to, to be wealthy and healthy and wise. Everything is going to be good if you just have enough faith. And we look at our lives and, I mean, I don't know about all of your lives, but I know my life doesn't look like that. And we think, maybe I don't have enough faith. Maybe I just, I just you know, need to believe stronger. I need to be more faithful, something. But then we see the reality that faith doesn't always look like success. Sometimes it looks like persecution, homelessness, worldly failure. Was reading a story uh, from a, a woman named Nancy Guthrie talking about her daughter, her daughter named Hope. She said this, she said, we had Hope for 199 days. We loved her. We enjoyed her richly and shared her with everyone we could. We held her during seizures. Then we let her go. The day after we buried Hope, my husband said to me, you know, I think we expected our faith to make this hurt less, but it doesn't. Our faith gave us an incredible amount of strength and encouragement while we had Hope, and we were comforted by the knowledge that she is in heaven. Our faith keeps us from being swallowed by despair, but I don't think it makes our hurt makes our loss hurt any less. She goes on and says, early on in my journey, I said to God, okay, if I have to go through this, then give me everything. Teach me everything you want to teach me through this. Don't let this incredible pain be wasted in my life. God allows good and bad into our lives, and we can trust him with both. Trusting God when the miracle does not come when the urgent prayer gets no answer, when there is only darkness, this is the kind of faith God values most of all. And she concludes, I believe that the purpose of Hope's short life and my life was and is to glorify God. The writer of Hebrews encourages us in the good and in the bad to recognize there's something better. Sometimes when, when things are good, we, we focus on how blessed we are. Okay. There's even a, you know, on Twitter, speaking of social media, there's a hashtag blessed. You'll see now and then where people are talking about how good their life is. We focus on those, those benefits of life, the good things that God has given us but if we hold them too tightly, they become a burden. They keep us from pursuing something better. C.S. Lewis talked about the fact that, that you know, in our lives, we recognize that no matter how good things are, it's like something's missing. It's like finishing that great meal, but you're still not quite satisfied, but you don't know what else is going to take care of it. It's that recognition that there's something more, something better. As Lewis says, this is, it's evidence that if there is something that we are longing for that this life can't satisfy, it's an indication we're made for something more, for somewhere more. Those good things, those blessings can, can actually hold us back if we focus on them and not on what God is calling us to. And those challenges can do the same thing. If in the challenging times and when things are not looking successful and well, we get bogged down and caught in that, then we don't, we don't 
continue the journey. But we're called to focus on something better. No matter how good or bad it is, focusing on something better, which is Christ. That is what the author is trying to get us to focus on. That we might run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, who is the perfect example of what a life of faith really looks like. Jesus, who in his perfect faith, in his perfect righteousness, was homeless, was scorned, was abused, and was killed on a cross for our sake. Because he knew that that meant he would have the joy of being reunited with his Father and sitting at the right hand of God. Sometimes the good things, as good as they are, they may be inspirational, but they don't change our character. It's the hard things that build up our faith, that change who we are. I don't know when the last time you read the book of Job may have been, if ever. But just as a, a brief reminder, Job, Job was hashtag blessed. Right? I mean, Job had it all. He was rich. He was respected. He had a great family. He was healthy. It was all perfect in his life. I mean, he was the poster child for Facebook. And then God let Satan intervene. And Job lost his wealth, and he lost his family. He lost the respect and admiration of everyone else because he wasn't wealthy anymore. And his health went downhill. And through it all, he remained faithful and he learned more of God's faithfulness. And in the end, received something better. The story tells it in terms of more cattle, more donkeys, you know, more children, more respect. But that is just a, a, a way of saying that he came through to a better life because of a better understanding of God. And Rabbi uh, Abraham Heschel says this about Job. He says, faith like Job's cannot be shaken because it is the result of having been shaken. Faith like Job's cannot be shaken because it is the result of having been shaken. Whether things in our life are going well and we feel blessed, or whether we are struggling and we are in the midst of that dark valley, we know that God is using it for something better. That God is calling us forward. Not because we can see what God is doing, but because we can see Christ. And so let us keep our eyes on him let us walk the path that God lays out for us, whether it is easy or hard, knowing that God will use both to, to build our faith and knowing that God is calling each one of us to something better. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Each Sunday we respond in faith uh, to hearing God's word read and proclaimed and our profession of faith this morning comes from Psalm 90. Yeah. It's a psalm that's attributed to Moses. Yeah. So let us profess our faith together with Moses and with all the saints in time and place as we recite this, uh, these verses of this psalm together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, 
From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And as we turn to our time of prayer this morning, I want to ask, what are those things we can be lifting up together as a church family? <laughs> Gail's ready. <laughs> yes, Gail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our prayers for Susan Letts and all those who knew and loved her um, the loss of her life. Thank you, Gail. Other things this morning. Yeah, Marilyn. So prayers for the Landane's daughter who is um, dealing with some, some challenge. Oh, two daughters, both, okay. Yeah, both the Landane's daughters uh, who are dealing with uh, challenging decisions and that they would have uh, guidance and good advice and uh, that God would work for them well. Other things this morning. Yes, Paul. Yeah. So our prayers with Paul as he goes in to have a defibrillator uh, installed, I guess. <laughs> and, um, that, and our prayers that it will indeed uh, address the, the issues that brought on the, uh, the incident back in July. Okay. Um, from the first service, wanted to um, share our prayers for, uh, for Teresa and David. Teresa and David are heading back to Mayo today for a post-operative visit. Um, everything is going well. And, um, but poor Teresa is, is going around like this because she has to keep her arm straight and elevated um, without a brace. <laughs> so, um, but our continued prayers with uh, David and Teresa, David in his um, being a caregiver, which is a, uh, a new role for him um, at that level at least. Our continued prayers for, for Dory and Carl and the family. Um, and um, also we had a... a uh, wedding that's coming up next weekend, and so our prayers with Reed and Lucy as they are wed. That's Jan and, and Ken Stewart's uh, son and his bride to be. Um, and is there anything else this morning? Oh, yes, shall we? Continued prayers with Ken Burnett as he <coughs> deals with his health challenges. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, let us turn to God in prayer. Lord our God, we uh, come before you in faith, trusting that you are a God who hears our prayers and answers our prayers. Uh, and when the answers aren't what we uh, are hoping for, trusting that you have something better in mind. God, we thank you for the assurance that you are with us through the good things and the bad things and that we can count on you to, uh, to bring us through them. And so we lift our prayers this morning, Lord, prayers for, for those in need of healing, continued prayers for uh, Teresa and for Dory, for Paul as he uh, goes in for surgery tomorrow, for Ken, And uh, we pray, Lord, for, uh, for those who are um, dealing with grief and hurt. And we pray for uh, particularly the family of Susan Letts. And we can continue to remember the Vanderbregans, Lord. God, you are uh, a God not only of, of hard times, but of good times, and we bring our joys to you as well the joys of, of children who, um, even when making challenging decisions, um, that we can, we can uh, rely on your presence with them as we pray for the Landane's daughters. Prayers for Reed and Lucy as they enter into marriage. 
prayers for uh, the ways you work through people to affect our world, Lord. And we pray for uh, the ministry of Hands of Peace, that you would uh, continue to use that ministry to impact uh, people here and in Israel and Palestine, and that that might be one step towards bringing uh, new peace and understanding to that region. Lord, there is so much for us to pray about. And we know that uh, there are unvocalized prayers here this morning, Lord. But we trust you to know, uh, to know these needs and to bring them to mind that we might be praying with them about them through this week. Because we know you hear our prayers because we pray in Christ's name. Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we prepare to receive our offering this morning, let us do so um, in joy for those ways in which God has blessed us, uh, but also recognizing as the, pace, as the plate is passed, those other aspects of our life that God is calling us to offer up that they might be a blessing to others. So let us receive our offering this morning. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you like. I've heard tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father That's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you That's who I am That's who I am I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know that we're all searching for answers, only you can provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, who you are and I'm loved by you that's who I am that's who I am it's who I am and you're perfect in all of your ways you're perfect in all of your ways you're perfect in all of your ways to us Hardly speak, be so unexplainable. Why I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love, love. That's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. That's who I am, that's who I am, it's who I am.
Holy Lord, you have perfected love among us by sending your Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess and listen to your words of guidance as we humbly acknowledge your gift of grace. Give us the courage to embrace a lifestyle centered in your teachings. We offer you these gifts brought today as an act of responding to you in faith and love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us sing our closing hymn, number 446, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. And before, we, before we start singing, I want to encourage you to um, focus on this hymn in terms of both the Zion that is the, was the earthly capital, but more so on the heavenly Jerusalem that is that promise of something better that God makes for us. As we faithfully live our lives in the coming week, what does God call us to do? And brothers and sisters, as we head out into the world today, let us go with eyes open to the needs around us, to the people we're called to care for, not holding too close to the blessings and not being brought down by the challenges, but knowing that God promises something better. And let us go with God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and abide in us this day, each one. Hallelujah and amen. <laughs>